Once upon a time, in a communist country far away, there was a heavy bomber aviation regiment. During World War II, the regiment proved itself worthy in multiple combat operations, in particular long-range bombing raids against Berlin, Königsberg and Danzig. It was also the regiment which in 1942, amid the war in Europe, managed to safely deliver one of the top Soviet leaders to Great Britain and then to the USA. But is that what the regiment is remembered for? No. After World War II, the regiment became the first aviation unit in the USSR to receive the Soviet's most up-to-date bomber at the time, the Tupolev Tu-4. And it was this regiment that was regularly invited to fly their Tu-4s during Grand Air Parades over Red Square, showcasing the aerial might of the Soviet Union. But is that what the regiment is remembered for? No. In the mid-50s, the regiment became the first in the Soviet Air Force to be armed with the most advanced jet bomber, the Tupolev Tu-16, and a few years later was the first Soviet supersonic bomber, the Tupolev Tu-22. In 1965, the regiment conducted the first in the USSR bombardment while at supersonic speed. But is that what the regiment is remembered for? No. But you <clears throat> screw up just once, and in the case of the regiment, a few times and always epically, and you're remembered for that forever. The very moment the regiment got involved in an investigation regarding its crews exchanging the alcohol drained from their bombers for crystal tableware from a nearby factory, the unit instantly earned the nickname the Crystal Regiment. Not for long, though, because right after one of the regiment's Tu-22s while on landing approach collided with a train carrying frozen chickens, the unit immediately became known across the entire Soviet Air Force as the Chicken Regiment. It may seem that nothing could beat this nickname, but the very moment one of the regiment's bombers due to a ridiculous navigation error flew to Iran instead of Belarus, the regiment forever went down in history as the Tigranski Regiment. This is the tale of the 203rd Heavy Bomber Regiment and its legendary mirror flight. In March 1983, the Soviet Air Force initiated a large-scale military exercise known as Strike 83. Its objective was to plan and simulate combat operations to defeat the enemy's aviation and aircraft carrier groups while simultaneously redeploying bomber regiments to different theaters of war. The scale and significance of the exercise could have been seen from the fact that the overall command was carried out by the deputy chief commander of the Soviet Air Force, Marshal Alexander Yefimov. The exercise involved seven heavy bomber regiments, including the 203rd Regiment, which was a part of the 22nd Air Division, commanded by General Gennady Nesterov. On the 23rd of March, as per exercise task, the regiment's bombers took off from Baranovichi, successfully destroyed a simulated enemy airbase and landed at the Mazdok airfield in the Caucasus region. The mission was flawlessly executed, earning the regiment an excellent rating. But it wasn't the end of the exercise, since Marshal Yefimov, who was still in Baranovichi, announced that the enemy aircraft carrier group had suddenly been discovered and must be destroyed as soon as possible. To destroy the enemy aircraft carrier, which according to the brief was found in the Caspian Sea, General Nesterov developed a nighttime strike operation and promptly briefed Marshal Yefimov and his team of exercise inspectors on the details of his plan. The marshal approved the plan without any comment. However, then he decided to personally evaluate the execution of the task by the 203rd Regiment, so he and his team boarded the plane and headed to Mazdok, which arguably started the chain of unusual events. It's hard to say for sure, but it's possible that the marshal's departure put General Nesterov in an awkward position, since it could have appeared that the marshal cared about Nesterov's regiment and successful plan execution more than General Nesterov cared about it himself. And thus, General Nesterov urgently gathered his own team, boarded the Antonov An-12, and also headed to Mazdok. In the Soviet army, the arrival of high-ranking officers always brought unnecessary pressure on the military personnel. On top of that, such arrivals almost always initiated the, <clears throat> let's call it the Russian army phenomena known as IBD, which stands for Imitatsia Burnai Deityanesti, or the imitation of restless activity in English. 
To put it simply, in the presence of Soviet superiors, no one could be idle even for a second. And if it happened that you couldn't find anything to do, you had to pretend you were busy and make it look extremely significant, even if it was just tightening a nut. There was no exception in the case of the 203rd Regiment either, other than the fact that there was not one but two teams of high-ranking officers arriving to evaluate them at the very same time, and one of those teams was also in the active IBD state, since General Nesterov and his team were also eager to demonstrate that they were actively involved in the process of command, or whatever that could be at any given moment. Neither was Major Mikhail Chizhov an exception. He was one of the 203rd Regiment's pilots and also a squadron Zampalid, or in other words, the political officer, which meant that instead of having some rest before the difficult night flight, he had to write various political reports, aka the essential role of the Communist Party in the successful completion of their previous flight mission. As one of Chizhov's crew members, Vyacheslav Mirzlikin, later recalled, the situation in the briefing room was also a bit tense. First of all, due to the presence of multiple inspectors, but also because of uncertainty about the takeoff direction. The thing is that it is much easier to take off against the wind, especially in the case of heavily loaded bombers. But the wind at night was constantly changing and weather control couldn't give a definitive forecast. Unable to wait any longer, the regiment commander decided to take off in a westerly direction. This was noted by the crews in their flight plans, and they then left the briefing room for their planes. However, as they took their places in the bombers, another command was sent over the radio saying that the takeoff direction had changed to the opposition direction, to the east, and thus all navigators must update their navigation systems accordingly. And here it's worth mentioning one very important thing about the Tupolev Tu-22, its special navigation system called orthodromic. It's a bit complex, but to simplify it for the sake of the video, when using this system you could designate any point on Earth as a nominal North Pole. Usually this point was the location of the target. Next, you connected this point and the takeoff location was a straight line, creating the so-called orthodrome. If you flew along this line, the orthodromic course would always be zero degrees. Based on this line, the navigator then calculated the headings for each particular point of the flight, as well as the landing and takeoff directions. The navigator also calculated the magnetic course, which together with other important information was then put on the flight map, and during the flight the navigator checked and compared the actual numbers from the instruments with those numbers on the flight plan. In putting all this information into the system was the first thing that TU-22 navigator had to do right after the ignition of the aircraft's engines. And that's what all the crews of the 203rd Regiment were doing after being notified of the new takeoff direction. All except the crew of Major Chizhov. As Mikhail Chizhov recalled, he hadn't heard the new command about the takeoff direction since he came running to the aircraft when his crew was already sitting in the cockpit. However, it's still unclear how come Chizhov's navigator also missed the new order. Maybe his radio was still off when the command was issued, maybe he didn't hear it due to the deafening sound of starting the engines, but whatever the reason might be, Major Chizhov took his place in the cockpit and started taxing, not knowing that their navigation system was set with a 180 degree error. What worsened the situation was that according to the task, the exercise had to be completed in close to real war conditions, and thus all crews had to remain radio silent right from the moment engines started on the ground and up until landing at their home base at Baranovici. Meanwhile, in the flight control room, the situation was far from normal as well. What happened was that, probably still in the Ibeda state and in an attempt to impress Marshal Efimov, General Nesterov decided to personally take control of the takeoff process. He dismissed Lieutenant Colonel Karpov, who was in control of the regiment's takeoff, and took his place in the chair in front of the radar screens. The Tu-22 takeoff at night is quite a spectacle to watch. The heavy but sleek machine quickly races down the runway, followed by a bright 30-meter flame tail and then swiftly rises into the air. And probably that's what the entire flight control team was doing back then, enjoying the beautiful spectacle of the night takeoff. Otherwise, it's hard to explain why neither General Nesterov nor anyone else in the control room noticed that right after a takeoff, one of the bombers all of a sudden started to fly in the complete opposite direction. A 
As Major Chizhov later recalled, he completed the takeoff process perfectly well and, after checking all the systems, set the course for the first waypoint. Only then he realized that his wingman still hadn't taken position behind him. While searching the sky for his wingman and the other bombers of his group, it was already time for the next turn point, so he asked the navigator to check the course. The orthodromic course on the map is 355, the magnetic course 295. Our actual orthodromic course is 355, the magnetic. Uh... And here, as Chirov recalled, the navigator hesitated for a moment. Chirov thought maybe the navigator hadn't adjusted the lights in the cockpit and was having a hard time reading the compass and instruments. And indeed, in a moment, the navigator continued. The course for the next waypoint at Moil Rocks is set correctly. Captain, a little to the right, you should see the glowing lights of Baku. Chirov looked ahead and indeed, against the dark background of the sea, he saw a peninsula the shape of a crescent bending to the right, as well as the lights of the city down below. As Chirov recalled, he was a bit surprised that Baku, despite being the capital of one of the Soviet republics, looked so small, as if it was just an average-sized Soviet city. Of course, it wasn't Baku that he was observing at that moment. Here is what happened. Let's take a look at the 203rd Regiment flight plan, keeping in mind the orthodromic navigation system. I'm going to simplify things here just so you get the idea. If we set the location of the training target as a nominal North Pole, the bombers after takeoff should make a 145 degree turn to the left until their orthodromic course becomes 0 degrees, which they should then follow until reaching the target. That is if you take off in a westerly direction. However, if you take off to the east without having adjusted the navigation system, the 145 degree turn will send you in the completely opposite opposite direction. Normally, even if such a mistake occurred, pretty soon the crew would notice it, simply because the actual locations you were flying by wouldn't match your flight plan. However, in this case, by amusing coincidence, the first major waypoint, the Apsheron Peninsula with the city of Baku, had a very similar shape and was located at pretty much the same distance from the starting point of the flight as the Yeysk Peninsula with the town of Yeysk. With only one huge difference though, the peninsula was located not in the Caspian Sea, but in the opposite direction, the Sea of Azov. Being confident they had reached the Caspian Sea and following the flight plan precisely, Chizhov made a turn around the Yeysk Peninsula, located their exercise target, which appeared to be some random ship in the Sea of Azov, and performed a training missile launch. But the chain of coincidence didn't stop there. Captain, do you see Mahachkala ahead? Asked the navigator, referring to their next flight point, which was the town of Mahachkala, located on the coast of the Caspian Sea. Shurov could indeed see the town on the coastline, however, it was not Mahachkala but Sochi on the Black Sea coast. As Mikhail Chizhov recalled later, these weird matches of the terrain, distances and towns with their flight plan put him completely at ease and he fully relied on the navigator while checking only the orthodromic course himself. I know, it's hard to believe this simply looking at the map, but just to remind you, it was 2 am. They were flying in complete darkness. Unbeknownst to them, their Tu-22 had already been detected and tracked by the Soviet Air Defense Forces. In fact, the Air Defense had noticed them during their approach to Yeysk. The unidentified aircraft was unresponsive to radio requests, but its IFF system indicated that it was a friendly aircraft. Thus, the military decided it was a passenger plane, and they lashed out at the civilian air traffic controllers for not warning them about the change in the flight schedule. Meanwhile, the rogue plane all of a sudden turned left and started to fly over the Black Sea along the international route, quickly moving towards the Soviet border. Now the real alarm sounded, and at 2.53 am, the air defense urgently scrambled a pair of Suhoi Su-15s from the Saidar airfield to intercept and shoot down the unknown aircraft that was trying to cross the state border. Despite the darkness, the interceptors managed to find the Tu-22 with their radar, and they probably would have shot the bomber down, but it wasn't the end of these amusing coincidences. It just so happened that it was exactly at that time when, according to the mission task, the Tu-22 weapons officer had to deploy electronic countermeasures, which he successfully did, completely blinding the Su-15's radar so that they lost their target. Unbeknownst to Chizhov and his crew, they successfully evaded the real interception, and at 2.58 am, the Tu-22 crossed the Soviet border and entered the airspace of Iran. The further the Soviet Tu-22 went down into Iranian territory, the less and less confident became the navigator's voice and his reports. Captain, ahead of us is Kursk. 
said the navigator, referring to the huge cluster of lights ahead of them. As Mikhail Chizhov recalled, he indeed saw a huge city bright in the night, and the closer they came, the more impressed he was with the size of the city, which was too big for a regional city like Kursk. But the strangest thing were the mountains. There are no mountains around Kursk, just plains. Something was wrong, but Chizhov couldn't understand what exactly. And he was right about his gut feeling, because the city they were approaching was not Kursk, but Tehran, the capital of the Republic of Iran. It's worth saying here that intruding on someone's airspace is never a good idea, but in this particular case the timing couldn't be any worse, because it all happened right in the midst of the Iran-Iraq war, in which Iraq quite often used their Tu-22 bombers provided by the Soviets against Iran. Meanwhile, Major Chizhov asked Lieutenant Mirzlikin to use the Comet, a special geolocation system that existed for the needs of Soviet long-range aviation. The system was quite simple. The aircraft sent a coded radiogram that was received by multiple radio receivers across the USSR, which then triangulated the source of the transmission and sent its coordinates back to the aircraft. It was far from precise, but even with a margin of 30-40 kilometers, it worked pretty well, especially in the Soviet Arctic with minimal landmarks. But the comet was not responded. Not malfunctioning, but precisely not responding, because Merzlikin was getting confirmation that his radiograms were received, though no coordinates were sent in response. As they found out later, their radiograms indeed had been received, but the officer on duty, seeing that the signal was sent not from the Arctic but from Iran, decided it was just some sort of provocation and simply ignored their radiograms. Meanwhile, the navigator reported that their home base Baranovich was ahead and they should start their descent and landing approach. This was, by the way, the last time the navigator said anything on that flight. Chizhov responded that he was not landing until they could 100% confirm their location, so he started circling over the town, which of course wasn't Baranovich at all, but the Iranian town of Mashhad. Chizhov started thinking of where they might have mountains in the USSR. There were the Karelia mountains, but they were far to the north. There were the Carpathian mountains, which was plausible if they had weird from the course to the left. He knew this three air base was there, so he started calling them on the radio, but no one responded. There was no response from anyone. Everyone was silent. His navigator, three air base, the comet, the other planes of his group, the flight control center, everyone. And then something happened that was so frightening it made Chizhov, as he described it, doubt his own eyes and made his hair stand on end. He saw the sun slowly rising right ahead of them, which in no way could have happened if they were flying to the west. His navigator still remained silent, probably due to the shock of realizing his mistake. So what Chizhov did after seeing the sun was to turn his bomber straight to the north, hoping that way to get back to the USSR. They had been in the air for three hours already and there was another problem. They were quickly running out of fuel. So Chizhov started to call for help on an open radio channel. His distress call was finally heard by an air traffic controller from the airbase Mari-2. Both Chizhov and Mirzlikin knew nothing about this airbase and couldn't find any information in regards to Mari in their flight directory. They knew there was a possibility it was an enemy trying to guide them to their airfield, but they had little to no choice. They were now almost out of fuel, and Chizhov asked the air traffic controller to guide him to Mari for landing. Funny enough, two fighters were scrambled to escort the bomber to the airbase, but since it was early morning, one of the fighter pilots in a rush forgot to update his IFF transponder to the new code for the day. So as Mirzlikin later recalled, while they were making their landing approach at Mari, those two fighters were flying somewhere else behind them chasing each other. It's worth noting that the landing wasn't just a simple regular thing here. Mari Air Base was made for smaller sized fighter bombers, so the runway was shorter and much narrower than those intended for heavy bombers. Nevertheless, Mikhail Chizhov, who hadn't enough fuel even for a second try, managed to land his bomber perfectly on the first attempt. But unfortunately, this was not the end of the ordeal for the Tu-22 crew. The Soviet supersonic bomber with the new H-22 missile flying to Iran of course raised a huge disturbance in the Soviet Air Force and a thorough investigation started pretty much right after the Chizhov's landing at Mari. It was determined that the main cause of the incident was an incorrect course set by the navigator, which had made the crew complete the flight in the opposite direction, as if it was a mirror reflection. 
It's still unclear why the navigator missed the radio command about the change of takeoff direction, but most importantly why he ignored the numbers from the instruments. Most accounts tend to believe that Drazdetsky refused to doubt the orthodromic system, thinking that it was the magnetic compass showing incorrect information, and thus he provided the pilot with incorrect information throughout the flight. Speaking of the pilot, pretty much all accounts agree on Major Chizhov's exceptional piloting skills, which in particular made it possible to save the aircraft and the crew, but at the same time it's hard to ignore his blunt negligence in regard to the overall control of the flight and the navigator's work in particular. Had he just once checked the navigator's reports against the compass reading in his cockpit and the flight plan, he would probably have noticed right away that they were flying in the wrong direction. But he didn't. Neither is there a definitive explanation of why Iranian air defense didn't respond to the intruder. Sure, the Soviet bomber entered Iranian airspace while flying on an international flight route, but then it flew freely over Iran including its capital for more than two hours. Some accounts say that Iran actually did send their fighters, but they couldn't catch the Soviet bomber. Which I found highly doubtful considering that Chizhov wasn't running away but simply circling over Mashhad. The most plausible version, if you ask me, is Mirzlikin's explanation about the earthquake that happened in that region of Iran right at the time of the flight, which probably distracted the Iranian air defense from the unknown aircraft. According to records, the earthquake indeed happened in that region, and given the number of coincidences during this mirror flight, I don't doubt yet another coincidence either. As was typical for the USSR, even though the incident ended well with the crew and aircraft making it safe and sound, the repercussions were huge. Roughly 2,000 people in total were punished, downranked or fired, mostly from the air defense forces who failed to intercept the escaping bomber. Most amusing, if this word can be used to refer to punishment, was the reprimand of Lieutenant Colonel Valery Karpov, the deputy commander of the 203rd Regiment, who was supposed to command the takeoff process in Mazdok, but was dismissed by General Nesterov. Surprisingly, his reprimand stated that it was not him who was dismissed, but that he removed General Nesterov from command. As Karpov said, he didn't even want to dispute this statement because now he was probably the only one in the entire Soviet Air Force who had such a nonsense reprimand. Unfortunately, the worst consequences of the mirror flight appeared to fall on Major Mikhail Chizhov. As Mikhail Yartsev described in his book, suffering from never-ending investigations and fake accusations of defection or treason, Chizhov eventually decided to retire from the Air Force. However, this didn't help, as it seemed he took the incident too deeply to heart, and in less than a year he suddenly died from a heart attack, in a sad way proving the saying that the captain takes full responsibility for the deeds of his crew. In comparison to the tragic end of Major Chizhov, the life and career of First Lieutenant Drezdetsky, who was in fact the main culprit in the mirror flight, may seem to look like a Soviet success story. All accounts of his story without exception describe Drazdetsky as a poor skilled navigator who wasn't fit for service on the complex Tu-22 bomber. In fact, it was discovered later the regiment's chief navigator multiple times requested that Drazdetsky be transferred from a work as a navigator to another position, but his request remained unanswered. Meanwhile, after the investigation, Drazdetsky was downranked to lieutenant and then transferred to the 200th Bomber Regiment, where he flew as a second navigator on the Tu-16. He remained with the Air Force up until his retirement in the rank of Major, holding the position of a regiment's chief of headquarters. Which probably means that even though Drazdetsky really sucked at navigation, he was nevertheless exceptionally good with mathematics. I just don't have another explanation for his successful career. I mean, those who are good at math always succeed, because you need math literally every day. Of course, I'm not talking about the mathematical skills you might require to become a navigator in the Russian Air Force, because similar to 40 years ago, your primary tool would be not a computer, but the so-called Analka, a good old slide rule. But I mean those math skills that will help you in everyday decisions, even if you are just a casual person pursuing whatever your passion is. And I know what you'll say, I hate math. I know, I hate it too. Unlike most of you, I studied in a Soviet school and my math classes were at least one hour every day, six days per week for 11 years, occasionally mixed with classes of assembling and disassembling AK-47s and throwing grenades at imagined NATO tanks. 
And you know what? I still remember how to disassemble and clean an AK-47, but I don't remember much from the math classes. Fortunately, you don't need to take my past to learn math, because now we have Brilliant, an amazing online learning platform that offers an exceptional educational experience for curious minds. Speaking for myself, it is quite often that I give up on learning new subjects on my own because I simply don't know where to start or how to direct my learning process. Brilliant removes this barrier by having curated and guided courses that are designed to steadily level up your knowledge base. What I really like is that Brilliant makes learning fun and interesting by including interactive elements to help you quickly understand concepts. And they also have an app which makes learning even easier. All courses are broken down into bite-sized lessons which you can take at any time, anywhere, whenever you have a spare minute. You can take the course I did on math and logic or one of brilliant thousands of other lessons from foundational to advanced math, artificial intelligence, data analysis and so much more. And best of all, you can try out everything Brilliant has to offer completely free for a full 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash paperskies or by clicking the link down below in the description. And if you find it useful, which I'm sure you will, the first 200 people to use my link can continue with 20% off of their annual premium subscription to continue learning for an entire year. Thank you so much for watching.